it's recording now. Let me make sure it's recording. All right, so it looks like it's recording. Yeah, perfect. All right, so um, all right, I'll go ahead and get everything started, and we'll just get rolling. Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. This is Jason, and I'm I'm kind of another treat for you today. I'm kind of reaching out a little bit and uh, talking with Bob Hearn, the uh, current uh, king of the road here here in Tennessee for the Vol State uh, last annual Vol State race. So welcome, Bob. Thank you for taking the time. I'm, I know that you're extremely popular right now, so thank you for doing <laughs> this for me. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking about talking to you, I know you've done a bunch of these conversations already with a whole bunch of people. I, I listened to the Adventure Jogger already, and I know you've done a couple of other ones. You got a couple of other ones coming out. What I think would be fun with you is letting you kind of talk about your journey in the running and how it's kind of brought you to where you were a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, when we got to Vol State. Because, you know, I was looking at your races, and there's a whole lot of really interesting stuff that you've accomplished and done and not that ball state isn't exciting and isn't cool it's amazing i, I i'm not running a i live here in tennessee and i know how the people drive i, I don't have the guts <laughs> to run on the road yeah. here. <laughs> so so why don't we just get started a little bit and talk about kind of where your journey with running started you know kind of how it how it began you know what led you to you know you've done some i noticed you've done some mountain runs You've done, you know, I, I know you lay heavy on the 24 hour stuff yeah. um, as well. So I would like to kind of just let you kind of talk a little bit about that. So just where did it all begin? Well, I guess I can make this story as long as you want. Why don't I go? I'll go all the way back to the beginning. Um, I was. I was not athletic at all growing up. I didn't do any sports in school. I was in the marching band it was as close as it got. Then when I got to college, um, I met my uh, girlfriend, now wife, right at the beginning of my, my freshman year, and she was a runner. And I sort of thought maybe I'd try to start running, you know, to impress her. But it it just didn't really stick. Running just always seemed like um, just, you know, really boring and a lot of effort just for no real reward. And it sort of stayed that way for quite a while until I guess what happened was um, – Back in, I guess, 2004, I was working on my PhD. I was, I had been out of school for a while. I was an older grad student. I'd gone back for my PhD. And um, PhD students um, sort of have a tendency to look for distractions to escape from their research and their thesis work. <laughs> and for me, running kind of became that. Um, we had, my wife had taken a faculty position in Vancouver. We'd moved there. I was finishing my degree remotely. And there's all these trails there and there's this big 10K, huge 10K that everybody does in Vancouver. And I got talked into this team entry for this 10K and I'd never run that far before. And I thought, okay, well, I better pull my weight. I better find a training plan. And um, I realized that if I was actually following a training plan and I had a goal, you know, I was going to try to pull my weight in this race, all of a sudden it was very different. And I got I got sucked in pretty quickly and started looking ahead, did a half, did a full marathon that fall. And um, just, you know, it appealed both to sort of my analytical side, which I think is what most people, when they think of me as a runner, they think of my analytical approach to, to running. And that reflects my background as, uh, you know, in computer science and math and, and physics. Um, but... And it, and it did. I definitely, you know, tried to leverage whatever I could analytically to bring to my running, but it also kind of satisfied something very different because in order to run a race well, um, you know, it's, it's not purely mental puzzle solving. It's, it's keeping your head in the right space. And that's a very different type of activity than I normally do. And so I found that, that sort of change appealing. And I think, you know, that's sort of been a theme that has really come to fruition with, with Vol State is the, the more emotional, spiritual side of running has really um, just paid off in spades, the, the two Vol States that I've done. In the meantime, yeah, gradually the marathons turned into ultras. Um, I did, you know, some lots of 
in the U.S., you know, ultra running is basically synonymous with trail running for the most part. Right. And I got, you know, it used to be it was all about running Boston. Then it became all about running Western states. I did a couple Western states and I was OK. You know, I got my silver buckle the second time. I was I was never you know going to be top 10 or anything like that. Um, and then eventually I started doing um, 24 hour and I realized that that's really where my strength is, is this longer flat road stuff where it's not about pure speed. It's not about pure aerobic capacity. It's a lot more about the mental game during the race, um, managing whatever you can manage. And um, so those are things that I can bring to the table without being super genetically gifted as, as a runner. Um, so that took me to, you know, 2014, 2015, I got into the 24 hours. And since then I've moved into multi days and I've had, I've had a fair amount of success there. And so that's kind of the direction that I have poured my efforts into. Um, my favorite race, probably, you know, it's hard to not think about Ball State right now, but over the last several years, my favorite race has been Spartathlon in Greece, which sort of hits both my strengths. It's a 153 mile road race. Um, and also it hits all the emotional boxes, just the history that it connects to this, this sense of connecting with, you know, the foundation of Western civilization, all that stuff. And the, the culture there, the meeting, all of the international runners, it's just an amazing experience. Um, so, so real quick, Sparta, yeah. Sparta, 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 I can't even say now, Spartathlon, for <laughs> yeah. those that don't, that don't know what it is, kind of explain a little bit about what, what, what that race looks okay. like. All right. So here's, here's the story. You know, most of your listeners will probably have heard the, the popular account of how the marathon got started, which is, you know, 2,500 years ago, there was this battle of marathon when the Persians invaded Greece and um, the Greeks were massively outnumbered, but they defeated the invading Persian army. And then they sent this, this runner, um, Phidippides, to go bring the news to Athens. And he ran from Marathon back to Athens, which is actually about 24 miles. And the story goes, he got there and then he said, we won, and then he died. And so we commemorate <laughs> that with, with the modern marathon. Now, it turns out that there's actually not any substantial support for that story in the historical record. It doesn't occur until centuries after the event. Um, but the contemporary history does record quite clearly that before the Battle of Marathon, um, Athens sent this runner, this messenger runner, Phidippides, that was his job, to run from Athens to Sparta, which is not 26 miles, it's 153 miles, in order to recruit the Spartans to come help defend Greece. And uh, the history records very clearly, he left Athens um, one morning and arrived in Sparta the very next day, which is incredible. That means, you know, sunrise to sunset, that's about 36 hours. And, um, you know, over time, there's been some debate, was this really possible? Did this really happen? In the 80s, um, a bunch of RAF officers decided to test this and did a bunch of research and constructed the most likely route that he would have followed and um, ran it. And... I think three or four of them finished, one or two of them under 36 hours. And um, the next year, that actually became an official race. And it's been this ongoing race ever since then. Um, originally, invitation only. Still hard to get into. There's tough entry criteria. Um, and um, even, you know, the people who meet the entry criteria, most of them don't finish because the race respects the historical record and has that 36-hour cutoff for this 153-mile race. Wow. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty serious challenge for any for any runner so there's the historical aspect there's the challenge aspect no matter who you are it's a challenging race and you know when you finish in sparta there's this giant statue of king leonidas in the in the town square in sparta and you make the final turn and you run like quarter of a mile down this street surrounded by these kids running along next to you riding bikes the whole town is out there cheering for you and there's this giant statue of leonidas ahead of you and you you finish and you kiss his foot and you're done. And then you get uh, an olive wreath on your head and these Greek maidens hand you a chalice of water from the sacred river of Rhodus to drink through. And the mayor of Sparta is there to shake your hand and congratulate you. And it's just, it's the most incredible finish there is and sense of, sense of wow. satisfaction. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so yeah. is like, so you, you said it's, it's a road race. Like, yeah. so is it just like a pure road race? race? Like what is the, the terrain of the road like is it just like your standard road or is it like got some other sort of uh you know element to it most of it is your standard road i mean you start out on 
you know, city roads leaving Athens, and then you're along this nice coastline for um, quite a while. You pass some refineries. People don't like the refineries. People don't like the wild dogs. Um, once you get over to the Peloponnese, um, it's more rural. You go through lots of olive groves and, um, you know, herds of goats and sheep and things like that. Little, little country towns. Um, towards the end, you're back on, you're back on a highway into Sparta. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to say something else I was going to say about the course. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That, yeah. that, that's all right. And, 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 you know, I've heard oh, 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 yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go it's, ahead. It's uh, in terms of the elevation, it's not, there's not a huge amount of elevation. There's some rolling. The weather is a bigger concern because it's very hot and humid because it's done at the end of summer. Um, there is however, a mountain a hundred miles in and over the mountain, it's a very rough trail. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, four or five miles over this mountain. Um, but that's to hit, to hit you with that at a hundred miles when, you know, most people who are in this race, a lot of them, they've only run a hundred miles and they're getting to a hundred miles. And now this toughest part of the race is occurring. And then they got 50 miles to go after that. And this mountain, uh, Mount Parthenio is where the historical record says that, um, Pheidippides encountered the god Pan. And Pan was pissed at the Athenians because they weren't worshiping him enough. So when he got back to Athens, he gave him that message and they built a lot more temples to Pan. And, and then Pan helped them out in the Battle of Marathon by instilling panic in the, in the Persian army. So, uh, Wow, that's really cool. So, yeah. so, so the fun thing about running something like that is just like, I guess, like what you just laid out is all the historical stuff. Because yeah. like yeah. you're literally like, you know, running through this very ancient old world and I mean, even though it's it's kind of modernized, you're still you're still in it, right? Oh yeah, you're getting to run through all these elements and all these different t the terrain and stuff, and that has to be extremely extremely. I, I call it fun because it, it probably is. I mean, it's extremely challenging, but but fun at the same time yeah. because not a lot of people get to experience that and challenge right. themselves with something at that level. Mm -hmm. So so is that something that you I, I know you've done you, you've done it what once are you going to go back again or uh, I've done it three times and three times. Uh, going back in, uh, in two months. Yeah, sorry. I'm going off of what I've pulled off the Internet. And so, you yeah. know, sometimes it's not very good. So sorry if I missed something up. OK, that's you feel fine. free to correct me. Uh, so so that's that's pretty cool. So. So, so that one is, is, is a huge favorite of yours. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're looking at what that course looks like, um, I, I guess, do you do that aided or unaided? Is it, do you, or do they have support along the way or what's that look like? So it's amazing. There's, um, so I said, there's a 36 hour cutoff. There's actually 75 checkpoints, like about every two miles, there's a checkpoint and each one has a cutoff, but each one is also an aid station. So, um, you can do it without crew. I've done it without crew once and with crew twice. Um, you can leave drop bags at any or all of those 75 checkpoints. So you can, you know, <laughs> uh, more than most long ultras, you can do it without a crew. Um, of course, crew gives you flexibility and gives you moral support and stuff like that. But yeah. That's pretty cool. So is, is, is like the, uh, cause I know like I interviewed Jason Thanel last, uh, a couple weeks ago and he ran, he had ran UTMB. And he talked about how different the food was at the aid stations. It was a lot of meats and cheeses and yeah. wines and whatnot. So what does, what did the aid food look like in Greece? Yeah, it's not what you expect for if, if you've run trail hundreds in the U S you're not going to see bowls of M and M's and candy bars and potatoes. It's um, for me, I just drink Coke really. And that's enough to get me through. Um, Cause I don't, that's one of my strengths at running is I, I train keto. So uh, to boost my fat burning. And so I burn a lot more body fat than, you know, your typical ultra runner. And I don't need as many calories and Spartathlon. They have Coke at every aid station and I get by just on Coke, but they also have like, you know, like these little Greek cookies and, and crackers and rice things. And, um, I don't pay that much attention, honestly, but a lot of runners go there and are a little bit, you know, that's not what they're looking for. Uh, if they're, if they're oh, coming to us. Yeah. I mean, I imagine so. I mean, I'm sure it checks their gut a little bit too, especially if yeah. they're not used to it. So that, that's definitely something different there. Um, so, all right. So we talked about Spartat Spartathlon. Boy, it's really hard for me to say, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, if you're Greek, you you say Spartathlon. But Spartathlon. it's. I mean, for an American, it, I I just it, it sort of needs to sound like triathlon, right? Spartathlon. So I I don't know, but yeah, I think Spartathlon is probably more proper. 
So, so, so do you find running like the, the trail and mountain races? Like I know you've, you've done Western States here. Um, I think you ran Havelina stuff like that. Yeah. Do you find that more challenging than doing like the road 24 hour stuff where it's just like a grind or, I mean, like what's, you know, kind of well, like what's your, what's your gate? It's different. I mean, I love the trails, you know, like all, like all ultra runners. I love the trails. I love being out in nature. So we bought our house here in California to be out in the trails <laughs> before I became mostly a road runner. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's more just that I discovered that my strength is the long road stuff. It's not that the trails are really harder. It's just that, you know, I'm instead of being a front mid packer, I'm winning this, this long road stuff. And so there's an ego thing there. And there's, oh. it's also, it just, you know, the long road stuff appeals more to my analytical side because I can bring, I can bring more of my own special stuff to the game and make a difference than I can on the trail side it seems to be. So, so what was the first long road, 24 hour style or just long road where you figured out, Hey, I'm, I'm pretty decent at this. Like, what was that, so what was that race? That was the end of 2014. It was a uh, new year's one day race in San Francisco. And I had wanted to run 24 hour for quite a while. Cause I had a friend who was on the 2010 uh, national 24 hour team. And I, all of us had followed his performance at the world championships. And it was just the most incredible thing to, to watch online. And I knew I wanted to do that. And it took me a few years before I built up to the level where I felt that I could. Um, by that point, I had, um, I had just gone, sorry, let me turn off my um, notifications here. So that doesn't happen again. Yeah, that's all right. By that point I had, I had just gone keto, which I think made a big difference. Um, and I had done a few uh, 12 hour races, you know, in like in the low 70 mile range. And I knew that I had in the back of my mind, if I want to make the national 24 hour running team, it's going to take at least 145 miles. And that's probably beyond my capabilities. But, you know, who knows? I'll start. I, I tend to be somebody who, at least in marathons, I run even to negative splits. And I was going to try to carry that over into 24 hour running, which most people don't do. Um, so I started conservatively, um, and I discovered that indeed I was not able to hold on for that 145 mile pace, but I, I slowed gradually. I didn't self-destruct and gradually as the race wore on, I was just slapping everybody else. And I ran, um, I think 139 and a half miles, which was a big course record and, um, got me an entry into desert solstice, which is the premier invitational 24 hour race, um, the next year. And then I realized that, Hey, this I've sort of found my found my niche here. I found something that um, my skills translate well to, and I can beat everybody else. So let's push on that and <laughs> see what happens. Right. So you 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 found a, a formula and it, and it worked. So you went to Desert Solstice, and um, you you've done that a ton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and how long did it take you to really, you, you, you've been out in the desert for a while. Did it take you a while to get acclimated to that type of running out in that type of dry heat? No, I mean, where I live in California, it's, it's certainly dry compared to where you live, um, where my parents live in Nashville. Um, it, it uh, no, I, I like running in the, in the dry, you know, it, the desert solstice is in December. So it's, it can be a little warm. It can get up into the seventies, but it's usually not hot. And um, really, really great conditions. You just have to, if you're not used to it, you got to be prepared to hydrate a little bit more because that dehydration will sneak up on you. But that it doesn't, it hasn't bothered me. Right. So, so you, you've, I've noticed you also um, recently, of course, bad water just happened um, and you, you did, you did bad water, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 that, that's a, that's a pretty tough road race as well. It is. And it's one that, you know, I was certainly aware of bad water and had a lot of friends that had run it for years. I never really had a strong desire to run it because it just sort of seemed to me torture for the sake of torture. Just let's run in the hottest place on earth at the hottest time of the year, just for the sake of doing that. And right. I, didn't, I didn't like running in the heat, but um, when I first got into Spartathlon in 2015, I had to do my heat training which I, I did. I did a bunch of sauna training and, you know, Spartathlon is hot and humid, but my training had worked and I got through it. And I discovered that 
almost everybody else on the U.S. partathlon team had run Badwater. And, and that, that year, I was the first, well, the first male American finisher. Um, Katie Nagy, actually two women on the U.S. team um, beat me that year. But I beat most of the other Americans at Spartathlon. And I could see that most of them, if I looked at their bad waters, um, they were faster times than Spartathlon. And so if I tried to project you know, back to my potential bad water for myself, it looked like I ought to be able to do pretty well at bad water. And so I didn't get around to that until a few years later, 2018. And um, yeah, it, it wasn't the greatest experience for me. It, well, for one thing, 2018 was the hottest year on record so far at Badwater. Um, and, you know, I trained for the heat, but um, the other thing is Badwater in the last few years has gone to a night start, used to have a morning start, and then the Park Service changed the rules nominally so to make it less stressful on the runners so that they're not out there running in the heat of the day. But to me, it makes it much more challenging because it means that um, you have to run through two nights, uh, pretty much no matter who you are. Um, Whereas before, if you were going to be running under 30 hours, you'd be running in just through one night. And so you've already been awake all day. You start at night. Um, not only that, you're running through the toughest parts of the course in the heat of the day instead of during the night. So for me, it just made it a much bigger challenge. And that was when I was really just getting into running through the second night. I did one 48 hour before that, and I'd really struggled the second night. And then bad water, I really struggled the second night. And honestly, you know, I wasn't handling the heat that well. I think if I were to go back, um, I could do a lot better. But, you know, I was planning to run, um, I think 28 hours. hours. Originally, I was thinking 26 hours, which was the age group course record. Um, but then because of the heat, I backed that goal up to 28 hours and I ran 36 hours. So it was nowhere near my goal. It was one of my, one of my bigger race failures. But um, it was still a, an incredible experience. And I would like to go back and try to improve on it. But it's it's the kind of thing that it's a race that you really have to respect and you really have to approach with the right mindset. And I don't, you know, the race just doesn't mean as much to me as like Spartathlon does. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I can go back and give the race the appropriate training and mindset that it requires. So I'm going to have to think about that, see if there's some time I can, I can find a way to do that. So you, you brought up something, something that, you know, when you're running out in that type of heat, I personally struggle with dehydration. Mm -hmm. I drink and I have to drink a ton just to stay hydrated. So like, how do you stay hydrated in a race that is that hot? Like, Well, so the thing about bad water is, I mean, the extreme conditions mean that you were mandated to have a crew of with a vehicle. And I think at least two people, I had most people have a crew of four, which I did. And they're meeting you, you know, sometimes every mile, sometimes more frequently than that to refill your water, refill your ice. Um, so, you know, in principle, that's not a problem. In practice, that's that's a much greater rate of hydration than most people have experienced in training. And it's something that, you know, you get right or you don't, I guess, or you learn it through multiple experiences. And, and, um, I, I don't think I got dehydrated, but I don't think I managed my electrolytes well. I didn't, I struggled with the sleep deprivation. Um, yeah, I, it's just, there's a learning curve. Yeah. So, so, so when you're looking at hydration and water to electrolytes, how do you manage your electrolytes to your water when you're doing these big, long runs and heat and whatnot? Well, I've tended to, you know, back after my, my, first Western States in 2012, I way overhydrated. I got hyponatremic. Um, and then I read, um, Tim Noakes book waterlogged, which kind of convinced me that most people drink too much and take too much salt. And that's been mostly my mindset ever since then, as I drink the thirst and I generally don't take much salt. Um, and I think, you know, that, that position is a little too simplistic, especially for something like bad water. Um, I think you need more salt. And I just kind of was, was, I was using my own custom drink mix that was based on Morton, but I had reduced the salt in it and I wasn't taking any supplementary salts. And I think for those conditions, that was a bad idea. Um, so that would be a starting point, um, take more salt, but generally I don't, yeah, generally I drink the thirst and I don't take much salt. I got you. It's funny you're talking about your own drink mix. I remember, uh, 
I, I, I uh, helped crew Greg Armstrong, and he had this oh, two yeah. liter, his two liter of some sort of drink that he had that he concocted. Greg, you know, Greg has everything. Yes. It's like, you know, a homemade. He's built it from scratch, yeah. His own <laughs> yes. white cloth from a deer that he's killed himself or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Abs- absolutely. That made me think of that. So, um, so, so, um, another race that really jumps out, out at me and is the six days at the dome. Yeah. Running, running around, running around an indoor track. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, an element that I had not thought about with that this year was I was following uh, the, the younger guy, uh, Tagger Bennett, and he was trying to, yep. trying to beat that record. Right? right. And he was talking about how hard it was. He had misgaged all the having to run around people. And I guess you don't really yeah. think about all the people that's on the track and whatnot, and then trying to manage yourself around all that. So, yeah, you, you know what what was the draw with six days at the dome? Was it just 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 something indoor you wanted to try? I mean, did you do a lot of indoor stuff? Well, it. I mean, this goes back to when I did my first forty eight hour um, a couple of years earlier, and I had a good forty eight hour. I set the age group American record and. Um, Joe Fijis was there, who's the guy I took the record from, and who is the overall six-day American record holder. And Joe tried hard to lobby me to run six days. He said, oh, you can, you can beat my record. You can challenge Kuro's world record. And I think that's it's a lot of BS mostly, but it was, it was enough for me to sit down and start playing with the numbers and making spreadsheets. And I kind of got it's certainly an ego side thing there. It's very easy to work out on paper that, oh, you know, 606 miles that's joe's record or 643 even in six days for somebody who's run 150 plus in 24 hours you think oh that's luxurious you get all this sleep and you can do all this stuff and you know why not give it a try so i i yeah i, I moved up to six day my first try was in hungary um in, in 2018 and that um i had an injury and had to drop early um learned a lot from that experience but when the dome came along in uh, 2019 um you know, on paper, again, it sounds great because it's a totally flat, theoretically soft surface. It's actually a hard track, but um, temperature controlled, 55 degrees. Um, you know, you don't have the nighttime darkness to give you the, the sleepies and put you to sleep. On paper, it sounds like it should be optimal conditions to go for really big numbers. And I was still going for really big numbers. I was, I had a pacing plan that would, um, if everything went perfectly, I would negative split and run the world record. I didn't expect that was going to happen. You know, my 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 B goal, or really my A goal instead of A plus plus plus, was Joe's 606 mile American record, and I also thought that was a stretch, which it was. But I thought probably I could hit the age group American record, which was Joe's, I think 551, if I remember correctly. And um, that didn't quite happen, but I ran I ran 530. It was a good race. Holy um, cow! <laughs> yeah. And it was, um, you know, like number seven all time U.S. or something like that. And it was still, you know, it was only my second six day and the only time I had run for all six days. So it was still definitely a learning curve. But, you know, the running around people on a track, you know, I was used to that because I'd run a lot of, you know, desert solstice and other stuff. And for me, the pace that I'm running at, um, it's it's much more of a problem for people like Zach and Taggart. If you're trying to run a hundred mile world record and you're out there with people who are going so much slower than you are, you're always running in lane two or even lane three for me, um, especially because I like to start slower than, than most people. That's not really a problem. You know, occasionally I'll have to pass people in lane two. That's not a big deal. What was a big deal was the lack of a day night cycle. And over six days that just became brutal. And, um, you know, I'm looking at doing six day again next spring, but I'm going back to Hungary because, you know, it's not, it's going to be, you know, there might be thunderstorms, there might be heat, it's not 100% flat, but um, being out there more connected with nature and the day night cycle, I think is going to be put me in a much better mental and emotional space over the course of the race. I can see that. And that, and it makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess listening to you and running all these races and maybe I missed it and who knows, I probably did looking through all your races and stuff that you've done. It, last man standing races. Had, is yeah. that something you've tackled before? Uh, I did 
uh, the quarantine backyard ultra last year, the virtual last man standing and didn't, didn't go great because I drew the short straw on weather. We just had these apocalyptic rainstorms where I live in California and um, I made it to, I think 34 hours. And then I had massive trench foot because I had not cared for my feet um, until it was too late. So, so I had to stop. Um, but I'd already learned a lot. Um, I, you know, I, at that time, yeah, actually up until really fall state this year, I, I would have said that my biggest weakness as a multi-day runner is sleep deprivation. And especially the backyard format, I thought I'm not going to be good at that because a, you know, Laz has, Laz has tried to lobby me to run, to run bigs. He said, this is something you should be really good at. And I'm like, well, first of all, one of my strengths is my, I run more even pacing than most people do. And you're sort of making everyone run even pacing by making them only run four and one, six miles an hour. So there goes an advantage. And then the other thing is sleep. You know, if you want to get more than five minutes of sleep, you got to run pretty fast, especially at Biggs, which is a trail course during the day. Um, and I just didn't see that I would be excellent at going for a huge amount of time with no more than five or 10 minutes of sleep. Um, I was entered into Biggs in 2019, but I was way too beat up after running the dome. So I didn't, I didn't start. Um, but during the, the quarantine backyard ultra last year, I was shocked at how hard it was mentally to get through the first night, not the weather. The weather was, was, you know, I run through rain all the time. Um, yeah, cause that was before my feet really got trashed, but just mentally, you know, if I can run 154 miles in 24 hours, you know, the backyard format, you do four and one, six miles every hour or a hundred miles every 24 hours, that should be a piece of cake. Um, yeah. but mentally it was not a piece of cake because, you're not thinking of it as 24 hour race. You're thinking of it as an indefinitely long race. And that was the whole genius of Laz's original design as this sort of psychological torture test to put runners in this position where the way that they think about the race is really critically important to, to who wins. And every year you see these really talented runners drunk out before even 24 hours are up. And it's, right. they, they got way more talent than that, but mentally they're, they're worn down. And I, I went through that. And I pushed through that to the other side. And by the second day, I was in a better place. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm kind of starting to grok the, you know, the mental zen of how you run backyard. This is cool. But then my feet got trashed and I had to, I had to stop. So, well, 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 the other element with running bigs is, and I'm trying to sell you to do it because I, I, would, I would come down and watch you, uh, is uh, you have people to keep you awake. Yeah. I mean, because you're, yeah. you're literally running with people like I remember, what was it when Harvey and Courtney was running? They yeah. were literally running yeah. together for like for for it seemed like for virtually yeah. forever. Um, so th you do have that element, it seems like right. that that could help with sleep, sleep deprivation, I guess, a little bit. I mean, I I wouldn't know, but just, yes, yeah. you, you know, it would just be so, a thought. Yeah, I mean, just skip ahead to the end. I, I after Vol State this year. Uh, my attitude about sleep deprivation has changed. And I think maybe to a certain extent, I kind of had a mental block. It's not, it's maybe more mental, emotional than physiological. And um, I think maybe I could do better there than I had thought. And I, I would like, you know, I, like I say, I don't think, I think the people who do well at bigs, you got to be a little bit of a faster runner than I am and a little bit more of a trail runner um, to do, to do well. You got to be running consistent you know, I think like 45 minute laps during the day to get, to get those breaks. And I'm just not that fast a trail runner. Um, but you know, I've got a lot of great friends who run bigs and I would love to go there and experience that with them, even though I, you know, I'd like to think I could last 48 hours. I'm not, I doubt, really doubt I would be out there for 72 hours just because of the trail aspect of it, I think. Um, but the other problem with bigs is it always conflicts with Spartathlon, and that's that's my favorite race. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Yep, I yeah. forgot about that. Now, since you say that, I, I remember that they were together. So, yeah. All right. Well, you know, I guess let's we, we can move to Ball State now a little bit because, I, okay. I you know, uh, because, you know, we, we've hit on all these other races. And, I, you know, listening to some of the other podcasts and other things where you've talked about it, you know, I wanted to hear – kind of what you did leading up to this because i was like yeah. i was thinking i was thinking you know he the man just didn't go out and just bust this course up without some sort of great you know pedigree of yeah. running 
And so, you know, looking at what you've done, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, so Ball State this year, you know, you, you came in and um, I think coming in, you had pretty, pretty, pretty high goals, correct? Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, as I, I, I went into some detail in, in the previous podcasts I've done on this, but, um, you know, I ran Ball State last year kind of at the last minute, so I wasn't really prepared for it. Um, but I had a great race. And so from that perspective, I was kind of sort of eager to come back and try to improve on that and go for the course record. Um, but even more important, um, after the race, the state of mind that I was in was just like nothing I'd ever experienced before. It was, I, I can really only call it an enlightenment experience and lasted a, a few days. And I was just in this really sort of mindful, wholesome, awake, alive space that uh, it's just like, my God, this, what did I just unlock here? And I would do anything to unlock that again. So really, I would say more, you know, the, the, the spiritual aspect of this journey run is really in the end what I was more after than the records. And, you know, most people who run Ball State will tell you that it is a transformative experience. And I got to experience that firsthand. Um, and the other thing is most, most people run Ball State screwed. That's sort of the, you know, historically how it started. And, um, you know, there's 100 crude, screwed slots and 20, 20 crude slots. And you think, well, if you want to break records, you want to have a crew. And I wanted to go break a record. But then I sort of thought, well, you know, I'm going to get more out of this journey experience and connecting with, you know, the hospitality of the of Tennessee backwoods um, and everything that Ball State is about if I do it screwed. And, you know, there's also the screwed course record, three days, 14 hours. If I, you know, who knows? Maybe that can happen because I ran three days, 12 hours last year. Obviously, there's going to be some hit from not having a crew, but who knows? Um, so as the race approached, I, I said, OK, well, yeah, there's a I really have a strong desire to go for that course record. But that's just an ego thing. And Ball State is really so much more than that. So um, I kind of put that in the back seat and said, I'm going to run it screwed. And um, I'm not going to turn my brain off and just not care what happens. I'm going to run under control and, you know, compare to last year's performance and so forth. But I'm going to, you know, live that experience to the best of my ability. And um, I think that that attitude paid off and stayed, you know, that, that, that the way that I approached the race, you know, I won't, I won't say that the sort of, you know, the more analytical puzzle solving side ever disappeared because that's just what my brain does. Um, but so that was there, but, um, I was less stressed about my splits and when I'm going to hit this milestone and, and so forth and more concerned with listening to my body and my mind and running under control and with a sense of balance and, and presence. And I, I think honestly, that is what unlocked this performance because I would never, you know, three days. Four hours. I'd beat the crude record by three hours running without a crew. If I'd wanted to run three That's days, crazy. seven hours, I would never have tried to do that. You know, and, and if I had set myself a goal, any goal at all, running screwed, it would have been three days, 14 hours. And I ran 10 hours faster than that. So if I had tried to run purely analytically like I usually do, this would not have been possible because I would not have let myself run that way. Well, it, it, it seems just fall when I followed you. We're following along, watching it all. It, you were like a metronome. It was just like you were just just steady the entire time. And listening yeah. to you talk, that's exactly what happened. It, it's funny because when you think about Ball State, I always joke it's like a it's like a, a fast through hike through the state of Tennessee, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you know when you think about when you think about through hiking and stuff, it, you know, and we're talking about screwed, right? You know, you kind of have mm -hmm. to depend on yourself, right? You know, you have to figure out your food, you have to figure out resources, you yep. water and yep. all that kind of stuff. And, and it's, it, it's really neat, you know, watching you guys, you know, just, you know, watching you guys navigate through the course and getting through it and figuring out where you got to go and what you got to do. And yeah. so, and, and when preparing for something like this, did you have everything already mapped out? Like, like the different spots and different places going into it, or did you just kind of wing it as you went? Well, I had some idea because I had, you know, I, my experience last year was very clear in my mind. I'd gone over again everywhere I stopped last year. And I'd thought 
because it looked like it was going to be a little bit cooler this year, and I was going to try to start a little bit faster. So even though I didn't have a crew, I was thinking that, you know, at least through probably the first half of the race, I was going to be fairly close to where I was last year. So I knew, you know, I'm going to be coming this stretch through this stretch during the day, it's this stretch during the night, there's not going to be anything open here. Um, I didn't know exactly where I was going to stop in each town because, you know, last year I didn't experience any of that. My crew did all that for me. I had maps right. and I knew where all the convenience stores were and things. Um, but I, yeah, I was going to have to figure out the details on the fly. Yeah. And honestly, that it was a lot of fun, <laughs> you know, and, and being more self-reliant and not having a crew there also put me in a different mental space that I think was, was a good thing. You know, one of the things I mentioned on an earlier podcast was I struggled um, with needing naps at night last year. And this year I didn't as much. I, I would never have believed I could run through the night as well as I did this year. Part of it was last year, there's a crew van there and, you know, there's air conditioning and it's like, oh, I really could use, you know, a half hour downtime, downtime in that van with air conditioning. I didn't have that luxury this year. So it wasn't even a temptation. And, you know, a lot of the places you're running, there's just, it's not like you can just stop anywhere and take a nap. It's, and it's not going to be comfortable if you do. Right. So there's just a different sort of calibration point as to what, you know, you can do. And that was beneficial, I think, for me. But, and I think you keyed in on something extremely big here because I'd interviewed um, Jason Fennell and he, um, are you familiar with the Percy Warner Parks in Nashville? Sure. I've run uh, Flying Monkey many times. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so Jason owns the FKT for a hundred miles at Percy Warner. Great. And so, so he, it's funny, he had attempted it and he had brought his car down there or truck down there and he ended up quitting and he drove home. Well, mm -hmm. he came back and he attempted it again, but this time he didn't bring his truck. He brought his <laughs> bike. He brought his bike. Yeah. And so kind of your same mentality yeah. in your head there's not a truck sitting there. Yeah. You don't want to get on a bike and drive home yeah. not being done, right? And so what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's easier to get into a van. Yes. It's it's a convenience part, which right. I think keyed in on the kind of the enlightenment part that I think you covered really well in uh, in the adventure jogger where you talked all about nice. the, your headspace and everything. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. I thought that was really cool because I think to be successful at what you do you have to be able to manage your mind yeah, and, and to, to, to be able to, to, to push through those miles and get through all that kind of stuff. And I guess, you know, to kind of close things up, what was your favorite thing about Vol State this year? If you could pull one thing out of your experience at Vol State this year, I know you talked about the mindfulness, you know, anything other than the mindfulness that really came from that race that you really enjoyed? Anything other than the mindfulness, <laughs> that's such a big thing. Um, but it's connected to so much other stuff, just feeling connected to your environment. I mean, the, the, you know, the highlight of the race for me this year was to climb up Monteagle, which comes at 270 miles in, something like that. You've got this three mile climb up about a thousand feet into this little town of Monteagle. And it's this narrow, twisty road. And I did that in the middle of the night. And um, I'd been talking to my wife, but I hung up before that climb because I wanted to sort of be in my own headspace for that. And that was, you know, sort of the emotional, spiritual crux of the, of the race for me. It's when all the most insights sort of flooded into my head and I, I felt the most connection with my body and the effort and what I was doing and the landscape all around me, that was just sort of the, yes, here I am right now doing this. And this is what this is all about. And this is just awesome. So that would be, that would be the peak part of the experience for me. That, that's great. And I think that I know for myself, I have a lot of those experiences as well. There's usually one part of the race where it like, just, yeah, something just kind of overcomes you yeah. and you're like, you're almost like it's almost like you're in like a, a Zen moment where you mm -hmm. feel like mm -hmm. I've got it. It's like it's like you've got this force field around you and it's like you're you're ready to go. And like you like everything, you got so much clarity at that point. 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so that's 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 really cool. Well, um, I really appreciate it, Bob. I mean, you know, taking the time out. I know you've done so many of these, and uh, and I, I just really appreciate you know you taking the the time out to talk to me and go over some of your races. And I really enjoyed the the the, the Spartathlon. Uh, uh, you know, because I didn't know a ton about it. I'd heard a lot about it, but it mm-hmm. never really, you know, gotten, you know, you know, not really had talked to anybody who had ran it before. So it was definitely really cool doing that. So, again, thank you so much. And, uh, I, you know, maybe I'll see you at the monkey one year. Who knows if, yeah. you, if you run it. So well, thank you. Yeah, no, I'll be there this year. Yeah. Oh, you will. So I, I, hey, yeah. if, if 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 I get picked in the lottery, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, ho- hopefully, hopefully I'll see you there. So anyway, thank you again. And I mean. It was great. It was great talking to you. You have a great night. Thanks. You too, Jason. All right. Bye-bye.